So thank you very much. Uh, can I just get confirmation that you can hear me and that the slide is displaying okay? Looks perfect. All right, great, thank you. So thank you so much to uh, Columbia University for organizing this uh, really exciting symposium and, and carrying on strong for so many weeks. Uh, I think that we've all learned a lot about all the different facets that SARS-CoV-2 can hit in, in our lives and, and within our bodies. And so what I wanted to try to do today was to relay a little bit about how we got started into thinking about SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, and in particular, a uh, discovery that we made related to ACE2, so this important SARS-CoV-2 receptor, being an interferon-stimulated gene in human epithelial cells. And so all the work that I'll share today was a really close collaboration with uh, Alec Chilik's group at MIT, the Broad, the Reagan, um, and also the Human Cell Atlas Lung Biological Network. So my lab is focused on studying barrier tissue adaptation. And so here I'm just highlighting in, in very broad terms what uh, a, a non-representative skin, gut, or airway might look like. And these tissues are composed of different cell types, principally epithelial cells, these first points of contact with the environment, the stromal cells that help to support them, neurons that help to sense what is going on, and then hematopoietic uh, derives cells like immune cells that help to respond during times of stress. And so all these different tissues are tasked with dealing with constant inputs, whether they be microbial in nature, nutrients, or injury, and then coordinating the appropriate type of output, whether that be host defense, metabolism, or repair. And our lab is fundamentally interested in asking the question, what is the role of epithelial cells in adapting to and remembering inflammation? And so just very briefly, the way that we do this is to take these different tissues, turn them into individual cells in the same way as in the last talk that we just heard, we're not looking at averages across a population, but rather we're surveying each person and their particular hardships to look how individual areas within the city or within the country might be experiencing a particular type of hardship. So this is the same type of approach here where we're effectively taking a survey of each individual cell and asking what it looks like, and then reconstructing the maps of these tissues together. And this is a technique known as single cell RNA sequencing. I won't get into all the specifics of the technique, but I'm happy to address them offline. Um, and it's effectively been a really powerful way of moving beyond more traditional single cell approaches like flow cytometry to allow us to characterize all the cells and basically turn these tissues into maps of, uh, of cells that we can then work with. And so basically on one slide, the way that these studies are carried out is we start off with some type of sample and, uh, and also a hypothesis uh, about maybe the cellular basis of disease. We develop protocols to dissociate and encapsulate these individual cells with barcoded beads. That allows us to generate a matrix of genes and cells that we then need to discover the structure that is present within that using various tools of dimensionality reduction, then we cluster, and then finally we illustrate. And so during the course of the presentation, I'll display several slides that, uh, or, or figures and panels that look like this. Basically, in, in a nutshell, each individual point is an individual cell, and if they're colored similarly, that means that they share certain properties about either their cell type, subset, or state. And it's important to note here that this is only the beginning of these studies. And so what we do is we collect other types of information from these tissues, and then we iteratively go back through this process such that we can generate useful maps to test and refine hypotheses on the cellular basis of disease. And so here to kind of transition about why we were poised to begin to ask questions related to SARS-CoV-2 host pathogenesis, what we were basically doing was carrying out a variety of different studies that assess how different types of inflammation impact epithelial cells. And here it's important to note that inflammation is not just good, it's not just bad. It's an essential process that we need for the host to defend itself against outside threats. And it comes in different types. And so there's different types of inflammation that are either more geared towards antibacterial or antifungal immunity, antiviral immunity, or defense against things like toxins, uh, and allergens, for example. And then what we particularly focus on, on is the impact of these types of inflammation on the epithelial cells and on the stromal cells across these different tissues. 
And so we had already in the lab a variety of different data sets generated from airway or from the intestine that allowed us to test emergent hypotheses from our single cell RNA-seq data, both from these diseases, these chronic inflammatory diseases, but also rapidly kind of remobilize our tools and techniques towards asking questions about COVID-19. And so the first few weeks of COVID-19, I think for everyone was something like this, where we were trying to make sense using our own skill sets, our own vantage point about what we were actually dealing with. And it took a few weeks, but through very rapid data sharing on preprints and even on Twitter, we started to get a better picture of what was going on. And finally, these initial reports started to turn into published manuscripts. And so the presentation of COVID-19 in terms of clinical symptoms that really drew our attention were the following. And so from some of the earliest case reports of the clinical characteristics coming out of China and then later on from the US case reports and from Italy and from other countries, we started to get this picture of upper airway involvement, of, uh, of lower airway involvement as well, and in some cases intestinal symptoms too. So these three kind of principal sites that we were already studying in other diseases. And so here I'd like to also just point out how valuable these, uh, these uh, kind of data uh, graphical uh, elements have been, like the Johns Hopkins viral tracker or on the next slide, I'll show some elements of viral tracing to basically really illustrate the impact that this pandemic has had on a global scale. So clearly this picture has changed dramatically, but I just wanted to have it as kind of an anchor point of when we started to really ramp up our efforts into this, which was in late February, early March, where there were around 100,000 total confirmed cases worldwide. And obviously the number has shifted dramatically since then. then what we have here is a, a viral tracing element led by the Next Strain team. This has been really important to trace how viruses have evolved across society. And then another really fascinating aspect that we started to appreciate was that this virus was really characterized by its asymptomatic transmission. And so we started to get interested in what are the host responses that might explain this asymptomatic transmission? What is actually going on within the host? Is it because there's few target cells available or is it because of where the target cells are localized or some intrinsic quality within them? And so we basically started to focus on these initial sites of symptoms and ask what cells does it target? But of course, in order to do this, we need a certain anchor. We need effectively a key. And this is where some of the pioneering work from the first speaker that we heard from Stefan Pullman's lab led by Marcus Hoffman really helped to provide uh, a, a roadmap for what we needed to be looking for. So as soon as their study came online on ACE2 and TMPRSS2 being the two key host factors to gain entry into cells, we started to basically look within our atlases for these two genes and in particular co-expression of these genes to map the particular target cells within the upper airway, lower airway, and the intestine as well. And so just to quickly rehash, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 engages with the receptor ACE2. There is a proteolytic processing event by TMPRSS2, and then eventually fusion with the membrane that allows for viral entry. And this is, of course, very simplified, and there's other factors that are at play here as well. So who are the actual putative cellular targets? This is the question that we set out to address. And in addition, we also wanted to ask what are the host factors that actually regulate ACE2 expression on these cells? Now the approach that we took, I'll stress here, was existing single cell RNA-seq data sets across health and disease, not from COVID-19 just yet, from potential barrier tissue sites. And so we looked across human, across non-human primate, and across rodent uh, tissues, in this case mice, from the nasal mucosa, the lung, and the small intestine. This is basically what all the data, or some of the data, looks like uh, all together, uh, illustrated here. And we started to systematically work our way through it. And so within human lung, and also non-human primate lung, we identified that ACE2 and TMPRSS2 were localized on type 2 pneumocytes. So this is illustrated here very small clusters of ACE2 positive cells that also share TMPRSS2 positivity. Then moving over into the intestine, again, human ileum, but this is also mirrored in the non-human primate. We saw that ACE2 and TMPRSS2 were actually distributed more broadly, but in this case, not within secretory epithelial cells, but rather absorptive enterocytes. So those cells that are really critical to gaining nutrients from the environment. 
Then within the upper airway, we started to, uh, to look and we actually saw that these were present on secretory goblet cells. And so goblet cells come in many different types. And what we were really intrigued to see is that it wasn't present across all goblet cells, but rather within two clusters that were marked by genes like S100P, S100A4, LYPD2, and also S100A8, A9, and LCN2. And here I'll draw the attention to the fact that these have some expression of canonical goblet markers like MUC5AC, but they're not terribly high expressors of, of MUC5AC. They're also not within the submucosal glands expressing MUC5B. And so they're characterized by expression of other secretory factors that may not be canonical goblet cell markers. Furthermore, because these were tissues that were taken across health and disease, we actually identified that within the two clusters of secretory goblet cells illustrated here in shades of blue, we can see that as we move towards more severe allergic inflammatory disease, we actually find that these targets are basically drastically diminished. And so this suggested in some early work has borne out, although it definitely requires and merits further study, that these type two allergic inflammation might kind of balance with type one antiviral immunity and, and alter the balance of these epithelial barriers. And so of course, if the primary target cells are not there, that might have some influence on disease susceptibility. And so zooming in a little bit more to these secretory goblet cells and now regulation of ACE2 itself, what we started to realize is looking in individual data sets and looking across data sets is that there were recurrent patterns of interferon-induced genes that seemed to correlate with ACE2 expression within those subsets that were high expressors of ACE2. Here moving from left to right, and here illustrating some canonical ACE, uh, some interferon-stimulated genes that were present within the ACE2-positive TMPRSS2-positive cells. Now, of course, correlation is by no means causation, and, but kind of, uh, I guess, motivated by some of these recurrent patterns, we started to, of course, look across the internet, and if anything, we found conflicting reports where interferon, at least in Vero cells, seemed to downregulate ACE2 expression. But undeterred, we moved forward and we conducted an experiment where we treated these human upper airway primary epithelial cells with interferon, type 2 cytokines, allergic cytokines like IL-4 and IL-13, or other cytokines like IL-17 and IL-1 beta. And what we found was actually quite striking, and this was that type 1 and type 2 interferons directly regulated ACE2 gene expression. So why had this been previously missed? Interferon-stimulated genes are usually very well cataloged, and they're very robustly induced across many different um, experimental models. But in this case, when we started to look across publicly available data, we actually saw that they were only present in primary human epithelial cells. And this means that in many cases, cell lines may not fully recapitulate these, these gene regulatory elements. And furthermore, that in peripheral blood mononuclear cells where interferon responses are often studied, we didn't see a single positive hit. Then we were also kind of struck by the fact that there might be species specific differences between human and mouse gene regulation based on expression of this STAT1 transcription factor binding site that seems to be in two different places in the human gene, but in one location in the mouse gene. And so again, we only observe this in human epithelial cells, not peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and also not in mouse cells. And so we started to expand out the cells that we were testing, and we started to look to see if ACE2 was in fact an interferon-stimulated gene in primary mouse cells. So we conducted the same experiment as before. We treated mouse primary tracheal epithelial cells with different interferons, and we saw no signal, but STAT1 was being induced, a canonical interferon response gene. We treated human bronchial epithelial cell lines and only saw a faint blip. And then we started to look across other donors, and again, we in human donors from primary nasal scrapings, and we saw recurrent hits for type 1 and type 2 interferon. And so this really highlights that the right models, models are critical for studying disease pathogenesis. So we tried another attempt to induce this in vivo using uh, interferon instilled into the nasal cavities of mice, and we generated this lovely atlas of olfactory and nasal epithelial cells in, in mice, which is actually an interesting resource in and of itself. It might actually hold some cues as to the anosmia, this loss of smell based on expression of host proteases and ACE2. However, we didn't see a single blip 
of inter intranasal interferon, at least at this time and at this dose, inducing ACE2 positive cells in mice. And so again, this has important implications for disease modeling in murine models. But then we also kind of coming back to the beginning and some of these data sets that we had been studying, we were studying not only chronic inflammatory diseases, but also antiviral immunity. And so we took this data set that we generated in collaboration with groups at uh, University of Massachusetts um, between healthy and influenza A or B virus infected individuals from the 2017-18 season. We generated again one of these single cell atlases. And what I'll only uh, illustrate today is that bystander cells, so those cells that were not directly infected by influenza, but those that were presumably sensing upregulated levels of interferon, actually increased ACE2 expression. And this was seen in the same cell types that we, uh, that we illustrated to be ACE2 positive. So of course, the next steps that we need to do from here are to actually ask what happens during SARS-CoV-2 infection. So to rehash our results, what we identified were that lung type 2 pneumocytes, ileal absorptive enter enterocytes, and nasal goblet secretory cells are putative target cells. Unexpectedly, we found that ACE2 is a human interferon stimulated gene in epithelial cells. This was not observed in mice in vitro or in vivo. And the broader implications, as was highlighted in the first uh, talk, is that ACE2 is actually tissue protective in the lung. But in this case, the virus could exploit certain regulatory mechanisms. And here, the balance will be really critical to determine. And it's going to depend on time and location. There is still much to be done. So this is the team that helped to make this study happen. I'll highlight the tremendous contributions of Carly, of Sarah, of Sam, and of Ian, and in particular of Alex, and also the HCA Lung Biological Network. I'll also point your attention to two other studies, one now published and one in preprint form, that are highlighting specific uh, questions that I didn't have time to share with today. Some limitations from our study are that, of course, we didn't include SARS-CoV-2 virally infected samples, and that we don't have evidence yet of ACE2 regulation at the protein level. And so these are really critical steps to take. Some of the challenges are that monoclonal antibodies to ACE2 uh, don't really seem to work very well. And there's currently a lot of efforts to characterize these reagents and we'll anxiously await the results of, uh, of these types of studies. So some of the early hypotheses that we've generated here are the putative target cells, the regulation of ACE2 by interferon, and then whether interferon is actually net beneficial or detrimental in SARS-CoV-2. So I'll touch on two of these points in the next few slides, drawing from this broader minutes, community Jose. effort. Two minutes, Jose. So the uh, cellular targets of SARS-CoV-2 have now been validated by a, a tremendous effort from groups in Germany. This was recently shared on MedArchive here. And so what they identified was that uh, the cellular targets of SARS-CoV-2 are actually present within ciliated and secretory epithelial cells. And what's really fascinating is that these secretory epithelial cells nicely overlap with the ones that we hypothesized to be the putative targets. And in particular, the ciliated epithelial cells actually correlate along with also the secretory ones with the, present of, with the presence of cytotoxic lymphocytes that are really professional producers of interferons. And not only that, but they actually produce uh, more type two interferons than type one interferons. And so here, you know, I kind of lumped interferons together into broader categories. But here we actually have, it's important to, to appreciate that there's activity of different types of interferons. And so in our study, we looked at type 1 and type 2 interferon. They both induce uh, ACE2, but they might differentially induce different host restriction factors. And so in this case, this particular uh, gene GBP5, which actually helps to uh, inhibit furin-mediated processing, is preferentially induced by interferon gamma and not by interferon alpha. So of course, this all begs the question, where are interferons in terms of our clinical armamentarium of host-directed antiviral therapies? There's some very early results from open label trials of interferon alpha, in which case here, root time, type, and dose are going to have to be very carefully weighed, but there are encouraging results when paired with, uh, with antiviral agents. Furthermore, I'll highlight some work from the original SARS-CoV-1 uh, 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 pandemic, where we had, um, where, where groups uh, down uh, in, in UNC and led some, some really pioneering work 
showing how early interferon response or a delayed interferon response can have tremendous impact on the evolution of SARS disease. And this kind of double-edged sword of interferon is also starting to be borne out in, uh, in other rodent models. And I'll just close out by saying and, and, and kind of echo the, the first speaker that ACE2 is not just a viral entry receptor. It's actually a uh, key tissue protective element. So here illustrating work from 2004 and 2005, where we start to see how ACE2 can be net beneficial in the context of certain types of lung injury. And it might do this by mediating or inhibiting uh, the accumulation of angiotensin II leading to lung injury. And so what's next for us, being located at Boston Children's Hospital, we're really interested in learning from these seemingly more resilient children. And so children can become infected. They might handle the virus differently. And so what we're trying to do now is to rapidly generate and share data, uh, data broadly with both the basic and clinical communities in order to try to understand this evolving pandemic. And so with that, what I'll do is I'll close out by saying that you know, these so-called immune cells or the immune function, function of various cells is really something that we need to revisit very carefully. Epithelial cells have really important intrinsic immune roles. And so what we're really looking to do now is to ask how infection and inflammation can shape these tissue resident and permanent resident cell subsets during infections like coronavirus and also other, uh, other emergent diseases. And so we really need scientists looking at COVID-19 from all these different angles, whether they be social aspects of disease, public health aspects, epidemiological, basic science, and uh, the virology of this to really understand what COVID-19 looks like and how it impacts everyone both within and outside of the host as well. And so with that, I'll close out. I'll thank uh, my lab for their contributions to this work and also the, the funding sources that helped make it possible. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jose, for that uh, fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, we're open for questions now. Um, Wellington, if you unmute yourself, you can ask a question. Uh, can it be heard? Yes. yes. Oh, Jose, a uh, very nice presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. I would like to ask a question, and this is when we compare um, uh, the literature and even with the, some of the data that you have shown, that it is not very clear in many cases what is the regional distribution uh, of the subpopulations, for example, of goblet one, goblet two, what is the regional uh, distribution of the response to the interferon that you say? And I'm talking about uh, uh, specifically nasal versus trachea or extrapulmonary airways, uh, extrapulmonary bronchi versus intrapulmonary and so on and so forth. That's a very, I believe, very important question for us to address, given that you have yeah. shown this later. Yeah, so absolutely. And, and that's something that I think we, we completely agree. We don't have the entire basically topology from upper airway to lower airway. We basically looked at the most proximal and the most distal elements. What I'll do is I'll point you to, and, and I almost included this, but in the interest of time, I didn't have a chance, but there was a paper that came out, uh, I think yesterday basically in, in Cell from Ralph Barrick's group. And I'll point you to, to some of that uh, work just to, uh, to illustrate that particular point. And they've basically looked and systematically characterized in nasal and tracheal and, and lower airway in the lung for the distribution of ACE2 looking at in situ hybridization. And it might not only be ACE2, so we really need to look within virally infected hosts at different stages to actually understand whether these putative cell targets are the entire story or whether there could be secondary cell targets as infection progresses and gets more severe. Thank you. While we're waiting for other questions, just to expand on Wellington's question, with regard to testing sites, it would be interesting to look at the nasal pharynx versus uh, nasal versus throat, uh, and uh, even you know to dissect things at a absolutely. Point. Yeah, no, I mean, and one of the really fascinating things has been the the actual kind of lack of uh, severe nasal congestion, which has been reported. So it's clear that one can uh, obtain live virus from nasal swabs, but of course, nasal swabs come in five or six different ways. And so what they're actually sampling, I think, is, is very important to understand. And whether it's 
a more transient passageway to deeper lower airway or nasopharyngeal infection, um, I think is, is something that, that we definitely need to understand better. So I think we, we're, we're starting to get a better handle on kind of between host spread rather than within host dynamics from the, the current measurements that we've been able to take so far. Other questions? Um, I see that there was one in the Q&A. Okay. What do you predict would be the impact of co-infection of SARS-CoV-2 with influenza? And that was from, from John Riley. So in order to address that, um, we can't say anything yet about that. There was some early work uh, that, that was reported in, in preprint form, and it, it might be published now, in fact, um, from Stanford, I believe, where they started to look for co-infection rates. It's tricky to do that given limited sample sizes and how viruses might be circulating or co-circulating. Um, it's interesting to speculate that some viruses may induce in some individuals the ability for co-infection. Whether or not SARS-CoV-2 is likely to take advantage of those mechanisms more than another coronavirus is something that we don't understand. But it has been shown for other strains of coronavirus that actually utilize IFIT proteins to get into cells as secondary receptors that interferon can actually stimulate their ability to enter cells. What that does to you know, viral replication and eventual pathogenesis within the host correlated to the timing of interferon is, is definitely something that needs to be explored within the host rather than in more redu reductionist cell culture models. Stu Firestein, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi, can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Uh, th this is a question that's a bit off the track of what you're actually doing, but another barrier tissue, of course, is the vasculature and blood-brain barrier. And in terms of the nasal mucosa in particular, it's highly vascularized and rather superficial. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the effects this might have on uh, blood-brain barrier vasculature, because we now see some of these effects in, yeah, in uh, yeah. neurology. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think it's something that, um, that definitely needs to be studied in more detail and, and to really understand whether it's something that's secondary or primary in terms of infectious routes will be very, very important. Um, and, and that simply requires uh, the right types of samples to be studied directly. Um, you know, ACE2 has very important effects in the cardiovascular system. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising that one would see that within the blood-brain barrier, but I think it's still a little bit too early to speculate. Um, what I'll also do is I, I made one mistake in attribution. Uh, the work from Chanapanavar et al. wasn't from UNC, it was actually from, from Iowa, from Stanley Permalin's group. And so I wanted to correct that as I misspoke during the actual presentation. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, Jahar, if you have a question. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, again, a great talk. Um, so, so the mouse lung expresses a lot of ACE2, yes. type 2 cells and uh, airway cells. Uh, what happens if you knock out uh, interferon in, in the mouse? What happens to the ACE2 expression, especially if you knock out STAT1 or STAT3? Has yeah. that been done? Uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't been done. And uh, I mean, what our experiments would suggest, at least using the in vitro and in vivo interferon installation, and also some data that I didn't show, but it's in the paper, um, using a chronic viral infection, it seems like mouse ACE2 is not sensitive to regulation by interferon. Um, and so it seems like uh, in, in your original question to the, to the first speaker, it seems like ACE2, of course, is, uh, is having uh, distinct molecular properties in the ways that it interacts with uh, with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, whether it be from human or mouse origin. And then furthermore, the regulation may not be maintained. And so it'd be interesting to play with each of those parameters sequentially to understand how regulation and the actual molecular properties uh, of, of the, the receptor itself are going to influence the pathogenesis that we see and what we need to actually build within a mouse model to recapitulate the type of disease that we're seeing in humans. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jose, for a fantastic presentation.